for me today, um, our speaker, Joan Ruffgarden, embodies that sort of spirit of general education and basic studies. She's, she's great at math, and, <laughs> and, and she's great at English, and she's a very good speaker, and really the last decade has been a critical review of um, some major issues in evolutionary biology. So back in the day when I was taking basic subjects, uh, Dr. Ruffgarden's books uh, were textbooks. And uh, now I would say um, that a textbook written on evolutionary biology today um, would be a tad bit different than those textbooks uh, back then. And in particular, they would take into account um, many of her contributions over the last decade um, that uh, involve sociality and gender and um, social selection rather than sexual selection. Um, so I would like to say that today Dr. Ruffgarden will change how you think about a body of ideas um, that surround sexual selection. When I, came, when I was first hired 17 years ago, uh, I started teaching evolutionary biology and I started writing a textbook. Um, and of course I had a chapter in there about uh, sex. And um, many of those ideas, I think Dr. Ruffgarden um, would still say have some resonance today, but many of them also have sort of... Um, not done so well. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so if we can set myself up as sort of a straw man, then I think the coolest idea for my 1995 students would be the idea that um, all the showy feathers and whatnot of birds um, were the result of a runaway process whereby genes um, for female choice to choose amongst these birds come into linkage disequilibrium uh, with genes for exaggerated male feathers like peacock's tail, uh, and that females are choosy um, uh, of these sexy uh, males in order to have sexy sons, and for no really good reason, like for no really good economic reason, just because it's great to have sexy uh, mates that will then produce sexy sons that will then be sexy to other mates, right? But and, and that this is all just sort of arises some by, by through you know some kind of math magic that you know you might not quite understand, but whatever. Um, and so um, anyway, I think that that idea has uh, well, it's, it's very appealing. Uh, is, uh, is is sort of on hard times, uh, and and I think we'll we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, so um, before I give up the lectern, which you're probably all waiting for. Um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about what's happening afterwards. So afterwards, there'll be some cookies and punch. And um, the bookstore has set up a, a stand where they're selling uh, Dr. Ruffgarden's three most recent books. Um, there's a book called um, The Genial Gene. So if you're interested in this critique of this body of theory that we might call sexual selection theory, then that's in The Genial Gene. Um, if you are interested in evolution and Christianity, then she has a book on that too, which I think they're selling. Uh, and then the book that's kind of for everyone would be Evolution's Rainbow. Uh, so I encourage you afterwards to stick around and chat and mingle. The whole idea of the Evolution for All, All Talks is for us to talk with people who are across the quad in different colleges. So without further ado, join me in welcoming Joan Ruffgarden. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come, Paul, and thanks for all the work you've put into bringing me here, and thank you all for turning out on the last day of classes, it's just amazing, <laughs> on a beautiful day as well. Um, I, I used to live in California, I now live in Hawaii, and this is the kind of day that I would remember about California. Sometimes up north in San Francisco is very cold, so I'll forget about those and remember a gorgeous day like today. So uh, what I would like to talk about is the evolution of gender and sexuality and specifically uh, two, two things, two major parts. First of all, I'd like to review for you what sexual selection means and how the definition of sexual selection has itself changed uh, over the last uh, 30 years, and, 
And it's been a progressively good change, if you will. So, so the definition of sexual selection has become increasingly tenable. But still, at the end of the line, it might not be correct after all, even as suitably modified. And I would also, therefore, like to go into an alternative approach and, and an alternative theory to sexual selection called social selection that I've been uh, introducing and that my lab has been involved with now for the last eight years or so. So there we are, sexual selection and what that means followed by the social selection alternative. Now, what is sexual selection? The, the first and original definition, which you might call sexual selection 1.0, traces back to Darwin, and the emblematic species involved is the peacock. Now, Darwin wrote, quote, males of almost all animals have stronger passions than females. So we have the passionate male. And the female, with the rarest of exceptions, is less eager than the male. She is coy. So we have the coy female. And then there's this last sentence here. Or passage. Females choose mates who are more attractive, vigorous, and well armed, just as man can give beauty to his male poultry. So, what's going on here is that there are claims about universal sex roles. You'll notice the phrase here almost all animals. So, that the idea is that the male in an arbitrary species, you pick up a a worm or a butterfly, any old species, and the male in that species is supposed to be passionate. And the female, correspondingly, being, with the rarest of exceptions, is less eager. Again, in all species. And so the proposition is that these are general characteristics of nature. And because of these um, characteristics, we have the evolution of traits like the peacock tail. And the jargon here is that there are two types of traits involved. Ornaments, such as the tail, and armaments, such as the antlers on, uh, on deer. And the idea is that females choose mates who are more attractive, i.e. have ornaments, and are well armed, i.e. have armaments. And as a result of this, Female, as a result of female choice, males are bred to have these characteristics, just the way uh, a farmer could breed a cock in, for cockfighting to have uh, uh, armaments. And so the metaphor here is, of course, to uh, natural selection. In this case, the females are selecting. And the, the analogy is to artificial selection in which the farmer is doing the selection. And what's interesting about this claim, um, uh, in addition to the claims to generality, is the idea that females choose mates who are both more attractive and well-armed. So the well-armed male is supposed to be better at male-male competition. And the supposition here is that the female, that female interest coincides with the outcome of male-male competition. So there's a lovely coincidence of interest. Whereas, as you might imagine, the, the winner at male-male competition may in fact not be the better, the better father. And so the idea that there's a, a necessary coincidence of interest is itself problematic. Now, this was written in 1871, and you might say, well, that doesn't, that's, that's quaint. And uh, we shouldn't really take it too seriously. So then we have the modification of that, which I call sexual selection 1.1, which you find in the 1970s. And, uh, and I quote here from Jerry Coyne, who's a geneticist at the University of Chicago, and I single him out because he once wrote a scathing review of my book. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, and I think arrogantly, we, we now understand, got it? <laughs> Males who can produce many offspring with only minimal investment spread their genes most effectively by mating promiscuously. So now we have the promiscuous male instead of the passionate male. And here we have female reproductive output is far more constrained by the metabolic costs of producing eggs or offspring, and thus a female's interests are served more by mate 
quality, by that he means genetic quality, than by mate quantity. The idea here is that males with cheap sperm are in the business, if you will, of going around and uh, trying to mate with every female in sight. And the females because are constrained. So they used to be coy, now they're constrained. They're constrained because of their huge sunk payment or sunk cost in, into eggs to um, casing the males out, and finding out which ones have good genes and mating with those with good genes. So you get a kind of singles bar picture of what mating is all about. Now, both of these definitions uh, strongly assert sex roles. Okay. So the reality of these sex roles uh, was one of, has been uh, one of the major points of challenge. And there is a phenomenon called sex role reversal in which exactly the opposite happens. And good examples are pipefish and uh, uh, seahorses here. In the case of seahorses, as many of you may know, because these are common fish in, in aquaria, uh, seahorses have pouches. The males have pouches. And the females deposit their eggs into the pouch that the male has and become, in effect, uh, pregnant, so to speak. And so here's a male right here being having eggs delivered into its pouch. And in fact, uh, when you think of fish that have parental care, it's usually the male that provides the parental care. There's nothing particularly unusual about uh, the seahorse in this regard. Uh, whereas in, in birds, males and females uh, often provide the parental care jointly. And in uh, mammals, as you know, uh, it's the females who are responsible for the lactation and uh, the gestation initially, so that there tends to be more female parental care. But it's definitely not necessarily true that the females are providing the parental care and the males aren't, contrary to the definitions in sexual section 1.0 and 1.1. Now, when this happens right here, the uh, speed with which females can produce eggs can be faster than the speed with which the males can so-called graduate the eggs, that is, give birth to the eggs, so that the, the, the parental and so-called parental investment by the males is greater than that of the females. And so the eggs, so to speak, are cheap relative to what the, uh, the investment that the males have to provide. So this is called sex role reversal, and on its face is a direct contradiction to the type of sex roles that Darwin originally enunciated. Now, why, why does this happen? The idea is that the, the sex which has the better access to resources is the one that can provide the greatest parental care, and the other sex is um, stuck. So we get a, a modification to sexual selection 1.2, which you find in the 1980s and 90s which is that the sex with the higher proportion of individuals available to mate, usually but not necessarily the male, spreads its genes most effectively by mating promiscuously, whereas the other sex, which may or may not be the female, spreads its genes, genes most effectively by selecting to mate with the genetically best partner. So now the Instead of being able to assert as a generality that males behave one way, females behave another way, it's just that one or the other of the sexes behaves one way or the other way. And how do you know which? Well, you somehow have to look into the local ecology and uh, discern which of the two species, which of the two sexes is in the better position. So this is uh, troublesome. Now, you see, though, that we're getting a weakening in this type of definition of the emphasis on sex role. Prior to sexual selection 1.2, it would have been assumed that the cheapness of the sperm, that, that it was inherently male to be promiscuous because sperm are small compared to eggs. But now we find that that isn't necessarily true because in seahorses, seahorse males make 
sperm, tiny sperm, and the eggs, and the, and the females make eggs. And yet it's nonetheless true that the sex role is reversed. So that there's no necessary connection between gamete size and sex role. And that's what the strength of this modification, uh, this modified definition points to. But it, is even it okay? Because what, what these two, what sexual selection 1.1 and 1.0 and 1.2, what they all have in common is that they postulate roles, particular roles. And the, it's become increasingly clear, though, that the roles that are possible greatly exceed just two. So first of all, there's the phenomenon of the, the stability of the binary itself. Now, in the sexual selection picture, you have males on the one hand and females on the other hand, as though you've just got two sexes. Point of fact, though, the existence of the binary is problematic. Where, where um, biologists define males, the way biologists define males, is as the makers of the tiny gamete. And they define females as the makers of the large gamete. And there, the universe, the generalization that exists is that if you look at the gametes, and gametes are the cells that have to fuse to make the embryo, if you look across the plant and animal world at, the, at gametes, you do find that there are two sizes in any given species, that there's a small one and a big one. There aren't species in which there's a spectrum of sizes running from small up to big. Or, a, or, a, or three sizes, small, medium, and large, something like that. The generalization that does exist, the binary, is at the gametic level, eggs or sperm. But then the question is, does that gametic binary translate into the whole organism? Are whole organisms also obeying a binary? And that's where it's not true. So these are species right here. Uh, a fish, as you can see. In this case, in these blue-headed wrasses right here, the individuals, as they age, change from making eggs into making sperm. As they, and that therefore means they've changed sex by the definition of sex being the, referring to the size of the gamete that's produced. So these go from female to male. These are clownfish that live in sea anemones. And these go in the opposite direction. Here, they start out male and turn into female as they get older. And these are hamlets right here who make eggs and sperm at the same time. And so these are called sequential hermaphrodites. And the sequential hermaphrodites divide into those that are female first or male first. And these are called simultaneous hermaphrodites. And they uh, when they mate, they turn over one another. One releases eggs, and the other releases sperm, and then they, they change position and vice versa. And some people here are experts, actually, in this group of fish. So, the, um, so you see the stability of the binary isn't clear. Now, actually, it's not just in fish. It's in, if you think of plants, in general, plants as individuals are hermaphroditic because they produce seeds, and they also produce pollen. And the pollen is the male part, and the seed, of course, is the female part. And so your typical flowering plant is a hermaphrodite. And across the plant and animal kingdom, maybe 50% of the species are hermaphrodite, and the other 50% have separate sexes. So the individuals are, as individuals, separate sexes. So that's a real problem for the whole sex role conceptualization of sexual selection is that the binary is not even something you should take for granted and you need an additional evolutionary theory for why there is a binary because it's clearly a contingent fact that there's a binary or not. Now, furthermore, even in species in which there is a binary uh, in terms of sex, that is, the, that is, the individuals will make only one size of gamete throughout their lives. So if that binary is stable, the, uh, the expression of the binary may not be present. 
And I've defined gender as being the expression of an organism's sexual identity. It's expression in terms of morphology as well as behavior. So it's the morphological and behavioral expression of sexual identity. The sexual identity is what it makes eggs or sperm. So gender is how it expresses that fact about itself. And of course, biologists don't own the word gender. Uh, the word is owned, if you will, by the social sciences, but I've asked their permission to widen the, to widen the vocabulary. And they've agreed, by and large. So no, no one's too mad at that. So here, for example, is a species of birds called ruffs. It's a, a seabird. And there are three genders of males. That is the three ways in which males can actually present. This one here uh, has a collar around it, a black collar. This one has a white collar, and this one has no collar. And this is a female right here, which also has a no collar, has no collar. And it was hard at one point to tell the uncolored male from the female. Uh, but these are marked birds, and it's known to be male. The, the way that mating occurs here is that the, at mating time, the black collared males get together in a place and uh, called a lek, which is spelled L-E-K, which is basically a, a red light district of males. <laughs> so females looking for sex fly to a lek. And there there are a whole bunch of males laid out in courts adjacent to one another. And so it'd be like these front rows right here would have a bunch of birds, a bunch of male, black collared male birds. And the female flies in and, and, and they wave to them. <laughs> and okay, now there are the white collared males. Now, the white collared males hang out with the females longer than the black collared males do. And but they do leave, eventually do leave the company of the white collared males and they come to the lek themselves. And at that point, the black collared males court some of the white collared males and get them to join with them. And there's a, a little courtship dance and ritual that they go through that's been photographed. And so when the females come, they see some courts that have a pair of males, one black collared and one white collared, and others that will just have a single black collared male. And so then the female can mate with either a pair of males or with a single male. And the data are that the females uh, prefer to mate with the pair of males than with the single male. And why? I don't actually know why, but I conjectured that the black that the white collared males get to know the females longer because they're with them longer, and they get to make so to speak introductions when the females arrive. And I've called them marriage brokers. In accordance, now that's a conjecture, of course. But from the standpoint of a female, if you come into a lek and you see these black collared males displaying to you, you have no idea how to tell them apart. You don't know which ones are safe and you know, just how to play it. So if there's a white collared male that you've come to trust and he makes an introduction, it's plausible that uh, that could underlie the reason why females will <coughs> prefer to mate with pairs of males. Now, of course, you see right off the bat that we have two kinds of males. So, so we have two, two genders of males, even though they're both males. And this is a case, this third gender of males over here is still different, and its role isn't completely understood. So this was only discovered uh, a few years ago. Now, that brings us to this picture down here. This is a male-male mounting, in this case of a black-collared male on mounting a white collared, uh, an uncollared male. And it can also go the other way around, but the uncollared male can mount the black collar now. This is the only one that was that had a picture, however. So I would term something like this a homosexual but heterogenderal mating. Because it's a mating between two males, since they both make sperm, but they're in different genders. So this is really problematic for a, a sex role-based theory of se uh, a definition of sexual selection. We're not only getting an unstable binary, but even when you have a binary, you don't have binary genders. You have multiple genders. And furthermore, you have a lot of mating going on that has nothing to do directly with raising offspring. And when it comes to a homosexual mating, then there's not only 
homo, uh, homosexual heterogeneral, heterogeneral mating, there's a lot of homosexual and homogeneral mating, such as these uh, mountain sheep here in Montana. So this is a male-male mountain right here. And it's become clear that just just among vertebrates and focusing mainly on, on mammals on mammals and birds, that there are well over 300 species in which there's same-sex mating going on, sometimes between females, sometimes between males, in perfectly natural conditions. And this is a regular, natural part of the social system. So this is extremely difficult to uh, account with uh, sexual selection theory. Uh, based on sex roles. Now, there's still more problems with sexual selection theory. This uh, refers right here to a study of what you might call a poster child species right here. This is a, these are collared flycatchers. This little white speck right here is supposed to be a badge. This is a female. And this species in this species, the badge right here was described in the literature as being uh, a signal of good genes. And females were supposed to prefer mating with these birds because of the good genes that they would acquire. As Paul just said, they would, this would be the way to have sexy sons, would be for a female to mate with one of these birds and get themselves a nice big badge. Is it, is it true? Okay. That's the story. This is a, an important study here that came out in 2006 in Nature for 24 years worth of work with 8,500 collared flycatchers. So these are, are birds that were caught. And have you ever tried to catch a bird? Uh, I mean, th there is a lot of work in this. And these are measures of, these are genetic measures. Uh, H squared stands for the heritability. And this statistic here talks about the heritability of male badge size. And the meaning of the heritability is the following. If the, the parents, if the, the father's uh, badge size differs from, say, the population average by one millimeter, say, then his sons will have a large badge size that differs from the population average by only 0.38 of a millimeter. So the sons of a large badge size are also going to have a pretty large badge size. Not as large as the dad, but pretty large. So that's considered good heritability. This means the offspring do resemble the parent. And here's the problem, though. That the story, as the story would have it, the reason for a female to choose to mate with a male with a large badge size, is that he therefore, she, she therefore gets sons who themselves have a large fitness. The fitness means the ability of the, of the animal to leave offspring in the next generation. So is it true that if a female shops around, picks the male with the best badge size, that her sons are going to have a high fitness as a result? That would be the heritability of fitness. Now at any one time, you see, the fitness of all the different males varies. Some males will have lots of offspring, other males won't have lots of offspring. So there is going to be variability in uh, male fitness. But the question is, is are the males who are fit, do they have sons who themselves are fit or not? And the answer is not that the heritability of male fitness is basically zero. So that means a female is wasting her time if she shops around for a male on the basis of his genes because there is no genetic variation in male fitness. As a result, the heritability of female choice is also near zero. That means that if you as a female happen to like big badges, your daughters don't. <laughs> That's just your thing. <laughs> and, and then we get here, the genetic correlation of female choice and male badge size is also zero. So this is a very important refutation 
of the sexual selection story for a species in which it had been assumed that it was absolutely correct to begin with. And I call this category of problem a failed poster child species. Now another type of problem, and there are lots of them, including the peacock on my head, lots of these failed poster child species. Now another big problem is more theoretical. And I show you this slide because of this phrase right here, the Leck paradox, or the paradox of the Leck. According to sexual selection theory, females are out there shopping around for males with good genes. And if that were true, then after 20 generations of shopping, all the bad genes in the males will have been weeded out, and all the males should have equally good genetic fitness after a while. So the problem, therefore, is to regenerate. I mean, if you want to keep female choice going, the problem is to regenerate the bad genes. If you can keep regenerating bad genes, you've then restored a reason for females to keep looking, being on the lookout. Well, is there any source of bad genes which keep getting injected into males so that females can keep watching out for them? Well, probably not. There are now dozens of suggested mechanisms to generate the bad genes that make it worthwhile for a female to uh, continue being choosy. And I cite this paper right here because it has a nice table in it of about a dozen, and there's several more that have also occurred. And my suggestion is simply that there is no resolution to the paradox of the elect, that it's a real problem, that there are not any bad genes in all the males for females to bother worrying about. And in fact, that's consistent with these data here, in which you're showing that the, the heritability of male fitness is nearly zero. That's exactly what you'd expect if the paradox of the elect were true. All the males are equally good. They've, any bad genes they might have had have been already weeded out. So for these reasons, I think that uh, the theory of sexual selection, the stories we've heard now for decades, is largely incorrect. And in response to these crit critiques, we have what you might say is sexual selection 2.0 that's been coined uh, relatively recently. And I quote here from David Shuker in 2009, his so-called consensus definition. So the response of sexual selection workers to my critique is that I'm often, is that I've missed the point, is that a lot of them say to me, well, we don't, we don't teach that anymore. You know, that, that's passe. We don't talk about sex roles anymore. If that's the sexual selection of the past, um, that's not where we're at. Um, and instead, this is where we're at. That sexual selection now is selection of traits associated with competition for mates. So if there's competition for mates, that's sexual selection, period. That's all there is to it. And in particular, sexual selection is not dependent on what have been termed sex roles. And who then, what then is the subject area that deals with sex roles? That's now mating systems theory. And it's what seeks to address why particular mating or breeding systems form. And that's from David Shuker, and claims that that's a consensus definition. <clears throat> and, but what David does do, which I think is very useful, is that he lists sufficient conditions for sexual selection, even on this general definition, to be absent. And these are two alternative ways. One is that all partners are of equal genetic quality, so in which case there's no competition for, for mates, for genetic competition for mates. Or that the successful partnerships represent a random sample of pairs of individual phenotypes, and thus genotypes. Condition number one here is probably true, in that all partners of equal genetic quality, because we just saw that in the collared flycatcher, that we had zero uh, heritability of fitness differences. And that then means the partners are of genetic quality. So even by David's own definition, if the paradox of the lek is true, then you wouldn't even be getting sexual selection uh, in this sense. So in, as a result of this, it's my suggestion that we could do well to think about another approach altogether. 
And so I've introduced this notion of social selection uh, to be contrasted with sexual selection. And the phrase social selection comes from the idea of uh, selection for the social infrastructure. So the focus of sexual selection is on the social infrastructure within which offspring are raised. And so my interpretation of breeding and courtship, as you'll see, has to do with what's involved in constructing and maintaining the social infrastructure for offspring production. Now, there are two main ways that social selection differs from sexual selection, and they're in the direction of inference. In sexual selection, the argument is top-down, from evolution to behavior. And in social selection, the, the, the logic is from behavior to evolution, so it's bottom-up. And the way this works is that typically in sexual selection discussions, uh, two evolutionary, two strategies are formulated, and a genetic basis is assigned to them. And then the conditions for the strategies to be at equilibrium are determined. And then the results of that equilibrium, genetic equilibrium are interpreted in terms of the behavior that, that underlies the process. Instead, what we do is we look at the behavior, we model the behavior in, in real time in, on an hour-to-hour, day-to-day basis. Then we, aver then we aggregate over the behavior of the individuals to uh, get a picture of what's happening in the gene pool, and then we compute the evolutionary consequences of the behavior. So this is, leads to an individual-based model of evolution rather than a population-based model of evolution. And here's the way the setup goes. This, I call this a two-tier setup, where we model behavior and then, then model evolution on top of the behavior. And this is a picture of a chess tournament. And so there are rows of children here playing chess games. And our picture is that at each chess, each chess table here, you might think of as a bird's nest, or as the locus of a little family. And we'll model the dynamics at a bird's nest, or at a particular instance of the game. And then later, we'll sum up over all the games in the entire arena to get the evolution of the population as a whole. When, when looking at the game, at games, uh, Typically, in the past, it's been imagined that the parties playing the game are competing with one another, as you would in the case of chess, and that the two players can't talk to each other. They are, are silent. Now, there's another type of game, such as Monopoly, in which that isn't true. The players can talk to each other, they can make deals and side payments, and that type of game is one to which so-called cooperative game theory applies instead of competitive game theory. You're stuck using competitive game theory in the uh, classic approach because you're trying to make uh, behavioral dynamics mirror gene pool dynamics. But if you're starting at the behavioral tier itself, it's quite possible that the animals could be cooperating with one another and they could be talking, exchanging side payments and deals and then you can sum up over the outcome of cooperative games to uh, reach the gene pool dynamics. Now I'm imagining that there are two types of cooperative games being played at the individual, at, at the behavioral tier. One type, which I've been very interested in, are teens, which I define as uh, two animals, two or more animals, working together for a common goal, working together, that's in coordination with each other, for a common goal. And that this working together for a common goal is mediated by shared pleasure. And the shared pleasure can itself be produced by either physical intimacy, such as here, or by vocal intimacy, such as sharing, singing together in choirs or choruses the way birds do. So here you see a lot of physical intimacy in primates, and let me show you some physical intimacy in lions. This was a 
set of pictures given to me recently of two male lions, as you can see. One approaches the other, nuzzles it. If you have a cat, have you ever seen a cat nuzzle up to you like that? Then this, this lion over here moves aside and invites the other male lion to approach. and mount it. So this is a male-male mounting in, in lions. And this was shot by a photographer in Brazil uh, who was on vacation in the Serengeti and saw this and was absolutely stunned and took these as a, as a hobby and then gave them to a journalist of a Brazilian magazine that's more or less the equivalent of Time magazine here and I was at a seminar, I was at a TEDx conference in Brazil, and this uh, uh, journalist said to me, you just have to have these slides, you have to have them. And so I incorporated them in, into the lecture. Now, as you know, uh, lions work together as, as teams, uh, as coalitions to knock off other bunches of lions and so forth. How would that work? The idea here is that there's a fundamental difference to playing a game competitively or cooperatively. If you had two birds, bird number one and bird number two, and if bird number one could either forage or guide, guard at the nest, then this would be a representative of the pay, a representation of the payoffs that the bird could have. It could, if the payoff to bird number one is on the left, and the payoff to bird number two is on the right here, then if the birds were initially, when they were sitting at a table right there, deciding who's going to guard the nest and who's going to forage, if this is where they started, regardless of where they started, bird number two would move to foraging and give up guarding, because six is greater than five, and eight is greater than zero. And once they're over in this column, bird number one could, uh, could say, well, four is better than two, so I'll uh, guard the nest. So the outcome of this would be that bird number one would guard and bird number two would forage. That's what would happen if they were playing competitively in the sense that each took an action just to maximize its own uh, fitness payoff. Now, you have to ask yourself, is that necessarily the way uh, behavior is going to wind up, where the parties just play against each other? And the answer is no, that doesn't have to be the outcome. Because bird number one could say, ha ha, I remember. I used to make a lot of fitness over here. So I want to forage, and I want you to guard. And bird number two can say, tough, that's not in my best interest. But bird number one can respond by saying, well, I really do want you to do that, and I will unilaterally start foraging myself. So I'll move from G to F. I'll unilaterally move up there. And if I do, that will drop, says that to bird number two, that will drop your earnings from eight down to six. So that's a threat. Bird number one can threaten bird number two. Bird number one can actually do that and establish that the threat is credible. In that case, bird number two has an incentive to negotiate. Bird number two can say to the bird partner, well, some of the time, I'll do this thing. So bird number two can compromise with bird number one. Now, the optimal compromise is called the Nash bargaining solution. The outcome over here, if they're just playing competitively with each other, would be the Nash competitive equilibrium. But if they're able to bargain, then the optimal outcome would be uh, a, a place in would be a place in between these two extremes. So it's, now, when Nash developed this criterion for an optimal bargain, he was using labor management negotiation as a metaphor, and he was imagining that to to provide the threat would be equivalent to going out on strike 
and the counter threat by management would be a lockout. And, and if there's a strike, and a strike is painful to go through, but if the workers are established that they're willing to strike, that forces management to the table for a bargain. And so the question arises of how you get the optimal bargain. And, let, and Nash provided the criterion for what the optimal bargain was, but didn't say how you get there. And so that's the reason for uh, discussing a mechanism to get there. And the mechanism that I've suggested is that of shared pleasure such as we've seen in, uh, in these animals here working together. It's through the sharing of pleasure that they're able to experience each other's pleasure and uh, arrive, at the uh, arrive at the Nash bargaining solution. So that's tested, of course, by seeing whether or not uh, the uh, attaining outcomes jointly is in fact associated with pleasure. So. The analogy here is to what's going on in, in, a bas in something like a basketball team, where, as you know, when basketball players play, they, they love to make an acrobatic pass, like an alley-oop pass. You like to make two, two points with, a, with, a, with a, uh, uh, a lovely com combination play like that. Well, the pleasure that player's experience when making something like an alley-oop pass is greater than the pleasure you'd experience by making two foul shots, but they both just yield two points. And that's the idea here, is that there is an extra sense of pleasure associated with accomplishing actions jointly. And that's what I th hypothesizing underlies the notion of teamwork, pleasure-based teamwork. The other type of uh, organization that I'm imagining occurs at the behavioral tier are called firms, and it's illustrated by the parent-offspring relationship. So I'm imagining here that a parent is in a position to control the, the offspring and to determine how much food to give the offspring in response to the offspring communicating to it how much food it needs. And I've worked out uh, the details of how uh, uh, a family might be organized around the idea of a firm from economics. The supposition is that a firm, that a, that, a, that a family is like a firm whose product is offspring. And the job of a firm is to manufacture offspring. And so you could appeal to the theory, economic theory of the firm, for how a family might be organized so as to most efficiently produce offspring. And this then is a picture of my. Uh, the way a family might operate is that there's physical intimacy producing uh, teamwork among the parents, but there's, uh, there's an incentive provided by parents to the offspring of the firm to resolve genetic conflict. So what you do, if you want then, is you, you can aggregate over those types of structures in the behavioral tier to get the evolutionary tier and develop a genetic model for how the system evolves. This would be a picture, for example, of a payoff matrix in an, in an initial condition. And by looking at all possible uh, matchups between the different types of individuals, you can compute how the genes change through time so that this type of payoff matrix could evolve into a different payoff matrix. So there's a lot of evolutionary theory that you can provide. So finally, uh, we get to the issue of the other main way that social selection differs from sexual selection, and it has to do with the direction of inference. In sexual selection, you start with mating and go forward to offspring, but in social selection, you start with the conditions for offspring production and go back to mating. So this, I think, is mediated by two types of structures. One type of structure are those used in courtship, which I'm assuming signals, in effect, a premarital contract. This is, uh, these are laysan albatrosses, and they're negotiating, I think. <laughs> and what are they negotiating about? 
Well, they're negotiating about what we've just discussed, is how to organize the family, who does the work, who does the foraging and the breeding. And this type of ornament and these types of behaviors are relatively cost-free. In contrast, the types of behaviors that, the types of ornaments that are very expensive, such as the peacock's tail and the uh, proboscis at the, at the end of an elephant seal's nose, these I'm assuming, these are expensive, and I'm assuming that the function of these is to serve as admission tickets to power-holding cliques. Let me show you, this is, this is how a peacock mates. I have two, two pictures here. And ask yourself whether or not the peacock's tail, whether or not the female really cares is about the peacock's tail. <laughs> peacock's not even aiming at the peahen. The peahen <coughs> is largely indifferent. To the to the tail, <laughs> and that's that's the mating. And, and this is not the only time. So there's another cut like this as well. Um, Now, do you really think that a peahen is casing out the tail of the male? <laughs> yeah, she's being coy. Right? So, I mean, sir, do you really even think sexual selection is plausible after we go through all the data? So, there we are. Uh, what I've suggested is that we've seen a progression of definitions of sexual selection that have become increasingly uh, more removed from the initial ideas of sex roles. And, but even the, ver the definition of sexual selection that has had sex roles completely excised from it is still probably incorrect because of the paradox of the left. That is, all males are, are pretty much genetically equivalent, and there's no grounds for competition among, uh, there's no grounds for female choice of males for, for good genes. And competition for mates is probably not what's going on at the time of mating. And so instead what I've talked about is that we want to focus on what's necessary to raise offspring. And, and in particular, the structures of teamwork and the firm as, as devices or as schemes of organization which lead to offspring production. And then if we work from offspring production back to mating, then there are two situations that occur at the mating episode, which are derivative upon uh, what's the best social organization at the reproductive phase. So when you go back to the mating phase, then the behavior that occurs there is either of the sort which involves negotiation for a premarital contract, such as you see in the lace on albatross, or otherwise involves these expensive traits in males, which are used by them as admission tickets to power holding cliques, and, are, and to which the females are largely indifferent. And that would appear to be more consistent with the data than the stories that we have been led to believe. So the, the, this material is contained in uh, two books here. Evolution's Rainbow is now in Korean and Portuguese. The genial gene is uh, going to be in, has been translated into French and will be out in a couple months. And I've been blessed to have the collaboration of Errol Ache and Priya Iyer in this work. Thank you very much, and I hope I've done all this. Okay, so we'll have a few questions uh, first, and then uh, we'll go out with the mixer, right? Uh,
Well, since I'm talking, I guess I'll ask a question. This yeah. is a little bit obscure, but I think uh, oh, when yeah. Darwin first published on sexual selection, Wallace read it and said, well, I don't really like some parts of this. Some of it is sort of like natural selection. I buy those. And that was sort of the functional, or I think what you would call the economic parts, uh -huh. the direct benefit. And then, the, and then Wallace didn't really like the, you know, anything that was just choice for choice sake without any direct benefit or function, I think. That, did, did, do you know anything about that, that controversy or how, how, where would you put yourself in that, in that uh, do you think Wallace was naive or, or do you think he was basically on something? Well, it's, uh, m most of Wallace's objection to, to Darwin on sexual selection occurs in, in articles that he published. It's not as though he wrote a, a book that was counter uh, to Darwin, so it, you have to piece it together from, from a lot of sources. What strikes me about Wallace, Wallace's primary objection to Darwin was ha had to do with, so to speak, Wallace's theory of the mind whether he thought that animals were capable of choice. And sometimes it makes it sound as though he didn't think females were capable of female choice in animals, but it's more general. He, he didn't think that a animals could choose that much at all. And historians of science have pointed out that it's more his theory of the mind rather than his uh, uh, sort of sexist uh, account as though it were only females who couldn't choose, or males who couldn't choose either, as far as he was concerned. And that wouldn't really be relevant today because uh, we take it as established that, that animals have a huge amount of decision-making capability. So I don't think Darwin's, or uh, Wallace's objections to Darwin are particularly relevant today because they revolve around the ability of animals um, to make decisions. And, and so I, I don't position myself in, in the Darwin-Wallace dispute in that regard. I, I think it's a, that that dispute is somewhat passe. So, so what is your explanation for the peacock's feather? What's the selection? <laughs> the reason... Uh, that I think a peacock ha has the tail is that that's what a uh, male peacock needs to join a lek with other males. Peacocks are lek breeding. If I haven't studied peacocks in the field, but I have looked at chickens and roosters in the field. And if you look at a rooster, and maybe many of you have seen roosters on uh, in, at home, they they uh, when a rooster does a cockadoodle do and so on, a female doesn't care. The, the, the cockadoodle zoo is to the male next door. And, and that, and now imagine a male didn't have a cockadoodle zoo. What would happen to him? He wouldn't be able to hold his territory. He wouldn't be able to uh, be in the male game. And, and I think that it's membership in the power holding clique, especially those in the case of uh, left breeding birds, which is what the traits are useful for. You need to have them to join up. And they're irrelevant uh, to females. The females, so far as I can tell, are, are indifferent to these traits. And the uh, as Paul mentioned in the introduction, the original runaway theory of, sex of sexual selection is that the female uh, uh, should like, like a tail. And then the, then the tail gets bigger. And then the female likes the tail even more. And, and you get this positive feedback of increasing desire, if you will, on the part of the female for the trait and an increasing exaggeration of the trait in the male until eventually the process grinds to a halt when the trait just becomes too, too expensive to carry around and there's a cost in survival. But uh, I, it seems to me like a pretty, pretty direct refutation of a... Of a runaway theory is when females are indifferent to the trait. It seems to me absolutely necessary on a runaway theory that there be genuine female uh, desire for the trait. And if the females are indifferent, then then that's all 
kind of takes them out of the picture. And in contrast, if the mails care on my account, you, in fact, you might even consider my account to be an intrasexual equivalent of the run of runaway section, which is an intersexual uh, process. So on my account, the males do care, and by golly, they do. They manifestly care about each other's tails and calls and cock doodle doos and so on. Now, somebody who's a sexual selectionist would say, oh, well, still, that's just sexual selection. You've just improved sexual selection. Is, and that, because it's still competition by the males for access to mates. And that's true. But on the other hand, my, my argument would be that I would have to go to the reproductive stage to uh, uh, compute why this condition was advantageous in the first place. See, the sexual selectionist would say, okay, well, it's just inherently male to compete. And I would say, well, first of all, we need to start with the offspring and say, what is it about the local situation which would make the males not want to raise young jointly with the females? Why are they all together in their own separate way? Uh, grouping. And yes, yeah, sure, you could get competition among the males when they're off together in their separate grouping, but the prior question is, why are they off there by themselves anyway? And so, therefore, yeah, sure, there's competition among the males, and then you get the evolution of these characteristics, because that's necessary in the male social system. Also, on my account uh, in social selection, this notion of the admission tickets isn't restricted to just one sex. It's in the case of the of the uh, peacock tails, of course, it's males. But there are, are these uh, ornaments that females have. And I, I was originally led to the idea of these admission tickets by looking at this strange structure, the penis and the female spotted hyenas. And, uh, and this is an unusual <laughs> character. And this is a full-blown replica of the male character. It's not just an enlarged structure of some kind. There are little fat deposits to mimic uh, a, scro a scrotal sac, so the scrotal sac with a fat deposit in it, so it's so a full replica of the male penis, and yet they give birth through this, and, and it's, a very it's a very expensive structure to carry around. Why does a female do this? Well, on the other hand, female, female dynamic in spotted hyenas involves erecting these structures at the time of greeting and, and and so it's, it's an admission ticket to a female holding, a female power holding clique. And so it's not sex restricted on my idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, at the beginning of your lecture, I just wanted to make a comment. It reminded me of Anne Fausto Sterling, her sperms, the five sexes. Yeah. Do you know that? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to say, at the beginning of your lecture, just a comment that reminded me of. Yes. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, she's backed off that, as you may know. And uh, but I thought that that was actually a good insight at the time. But but of course, she um, talked about um, sexes, and we in biology wouldn't say there were five sexes. And I think that's why she had to back off that because we don't have five gamete sizes. And uh, so if she had said five genders and was willing to talk about uh, gender multiplicity in animals, but um, she didn't, but wasn't willing to go there. When you say that you know, maybe I heard you wrong, but really there was more than just male and female in terms of, you were talking about the seahorses. Oh, well, yeah, but she was talking about hermaphrodites, yeah. Uh, yeah, she was, she was, but still she was saying that there's more than just male and female. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, Isn't that what you were saying at the beginning? Well, I was saying that the binary, yes. yeah, that the binary didn't translate to the whole organism level. Right, and that's the thing that she Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I can check it again. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was reading your paper. Um, can you equate pleasure with shifts? No. Okay. I thought maybe you did. No, I don't equate it. No, no. But it's um, it's a guide to it. It's a pointer to it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And you can use pleasure for as a receiving mechanism as well as a mechanism 
for social cohesion. And do you understand what I'm saying? Not no. quite. Try it again. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems like, uh, I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You said it's kind of a, 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 a directional pointer. Pleasure is a directional pointer to fit. And, um, and so, it, does it, I guess it, to me, it seems like it correlates perhaps with fitness in, to some degree. But yeah. I'm completely confused. <laughs> Well, it, the the problem is is that there are um, terms defined at different tiers. different levels. Right. Yeah, different tiers. So pleasure is something experienced within the behavioral tier. Right. Fitness is something realized in the evolutionary tier. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming that uh, pleasure that through through the pursuit of pleasure. Yeah. Um, an animal is led to do activities that are fitness producing. Right. So in the choice of food, you uh -huh. choose food which tastes good and you avoid food that tastes bad. Right. In so doing, you increase fitness. Mm -hmm. And so the fitness activity wasn't the fitness wasn't the pleasure itself. The fitness was the activity that the pleasure pointed you to doing. Right. And in the same sense, social pleasure would be the pleasure you feel doing something jointly, and the result of doing something jointly is what was fitness enhancing. Okay, but the thing is, you can actually you can have a deception that utilizes pleasure yes. for your own selfish interests. Yes. And so. <laughs> Where are we going with this? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I haven't thought it out yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. That enhances fitness. Yeah. So what would it do? But you can have a cheating strategy that recognizes pleasure as a payoff that it might be able to exploit. Yes. And that instead of cooperation actually being an endeavor for two individuals right. increasing their fitness, it actually ends up being an endeavor where one parasitizes the other. Uh huh. Pleasure. Uh huh. Is that a yes? I, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but but but, uh, the, but then you know the you I mean if you think of something like an addiction where someone could give someone uh, an addictive. Well, let's think about sex. Yeah. Sex is great. <laughs> but we use sex all the time for deception as well, including sexual pleasure. Right? Well, I, I think he's just using people. That's what he's talking about. Well, he's like, and using the like using that pleasure tools to do things that they'll do. I'll do anything for sex. <laughs> I mean, you can live in the Should I turn this off? off? <laughs> I really, I really can't follow that. <laughs> Well, I can't clarify what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> the, uh, he's saying it's easy to get paid. <laughs> well, I mean, your your point is that 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 by offering pleasure without cooperation, one could one could uh, so a possible cheating strategy. A cheating strategy would be to proffer pleasure without delivering on the cooperation. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, 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 no. Not in no. that. No, that's the reason. That's the reason for the physical intimacy because uh, that way the parties in question are are in close contact. Like you can tell if you were in a on a basketball team or something if someone wasn't going to play up to their ability, right. and you could 
they, you'd have to read, read their sensations. Yeah. And you'd have your own sensation. So, well, there is, so there is policing. I'm not internal you know, policing. There's internal. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And so that that's what the physical intimacy builds into it. Okay. Is both the coordination. So you don't have to do repeat playing. You, you're not in a repeat, a um, iterated game. Right. You know because it's it's going on simultaneously. Yeah. And so that's what's keeping you coordinated, and it's the pleasure that's keeping you pointed in a common direction. And if someone uh, isn't isn't doing their part, you can tell right away. Reputation. Well, no, 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 no not reputation, no, you can tell right away because you're right, right, with right. them. Yeah, you're with them. And so it's the intimacy issue. Right. And, it's, and it's the same thing with, uh, I mean, that's the physical intimacy, but what about in intimacy in, in these interlocking vocalizations that you have birds do and so on? You know, Whatever when you break, yeah, when you break off, you know, it's just obvious. And so I think that's, that builds in, if you will, policing. I don't yeah. you know, use policing uh, as, as a term much, but it would be. Well, I'm just thinking yeah. of some way that would stop the other strategy. Of right. Cheating. That's right. And, and whether you call it policing or you call it cookies, yeah. whatever it is, it's some mechanism that holds them together. Yeah, you just disengage if the other player right. isn't. isn't uh, Playing by the rules. Playing by the rules is, yeah, isn't genuine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mo, maybe, uh, maybe Co later. Co <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of co short questions, and we have yeah. a couple of short yeah. questions, and then we'll we'll retire. All right. So, um, the behaviors you're talking about, liking, uh, pleasure, uh, sociality, we're talking about things that only occur in fairly sophisticated, so-called higher organisms. Um, but you're sort of touting this as a replacement for sexual selection theory, the stuff that old parts like me learned, that was sort of the general. Yeah. And what it seems like is yeah. we're only talking about a really small portion of organisms that engage in these kinds of things. So can you replace one with the other, or are you saying this is complementary? Well, I mean, the logic isn't complementary. Because I think even if, with lower organisms, uh, uh, the, the analysis of, of mating ought to begin with the, the reproductive episode and work back to, to the mating episode. And so you might recover through that logic some of the um, narratives that you would get from sexual selection. And similarly, I th think you should do the evolutionary modeling from bo bottom up rather than top down. And, so in those two regards, it would be a general substitution. Then the question is about particular narratives. And the narratives I'm emphasizing are those for vertebrates. Um, uh, it's going to apply to the apnea. Yeah, and Drosophila. Drosophila, any other model Yeah, because I mean, the thing to remember, if, if you will, is that it's not as though sexual selection is working, okay? That we have to come to terms with all the counterexamples, all the failed poster child species, all the theoretical difficulties, like the paradox of the leg. Okay, now, if you're going to stick with sexual selection, then you still have to deal with that. And that's a lot of baggage. I know that, I was mentioning to somebody, if I had to be a debater, and was trying to debate the sexual selection side, it'd be a real hard sell because of the amount of counter, the weight of the counterexamples so far. So you have to somehow explain away the counterexamples as well as reinforce the cases where it does, has been traditionally employed. And that's, and many of the people working in sexual selection, and I have just to say bluntly, are in denial about how much counter evidence there is. And I was certainly surprised uh, when I got into, the, into it. Uh, like all the stuff about roles. That's, that's not just invertebrates. And... 
So that's that's my response to you. Is that go ahead and hang on to sexual selection if you want. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's good, but it, I mean, it's good money after bad in my view at this point. Yeah. So the, from the examples you gave, my sense is that the weight of the baggage is in the low heritability of fitness-related yeah. traits. Yeah, yeah, that's a big and, one. And, so on one and hand, most sexual selectionists that I talk to, either they acknowledge that that's a problem, like Richard Crum, for example, at Yale, who says, okay, that's a problem. And so his explanation is that it's that uh, um, it, it doesn't turn up if, in, in runaway selection. But then, then he has to deal with the indifference of the female. Uh, then, uh, but others say, oh, well, that's a different subject. I've had a real heavy duty denial on that. Well, so when you threw up this data, my first thought was, well, okay, we we're maybe naive to ever think of you, really, because we've always known for a long time that the fitness of the 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 heritability of fitness related traits is, is it zero. Really, yeah. Really right. But because there isn't, because you know, right. in all those cases, though, right. those are you know, successful, persistent, long term populations where you, if selection has been important, You'd have expected to weed it out over time, and they made me exactly. Think, what about early on? Then it wasn't always that way. But oh well, that could be. Maybe it's a temporal dynamic. Right. Sexual selection when, matters first. That's fine. Sexual sexual selection, sexual selection could be the ghost. I mean, these could be this could be the ghost of sexual selection past. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wouldn't refute that, but but of course that would be an enormous concession on the part of sexual selectionists. To say that it was only a transient phenomenon. Because Don Levitan is in sea urchin, sperm and egg, gamete behavior is arguing there's sexual selection there. And I honestly, I don't remember what the arguments were, but there's no obvious ornaments or yeah. anything. I mean, you look at an urchin, I don't know what size yeah. it is. Uh, I got to cut it open, right? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. he's saying that it's happening at that level. Yeah. And, well, that's an, another point, though, is that it's sperm competition. So I, I agree that on sexual selection 2.0, you know, just the, the competition stuff, the sexual, that sperm competition is, is, a, is a bona fide case of sexual selection on that definition. So I, I have no argument with the sperm competition literature. Well, this just goes to prove that people who teach evolutionary biology can't ask short questions. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very short question? Yeah, sure. Um, this is a question about the argument of dynamic. So um, it looks like there's a lot of evidence that the, uh, the, the sexual selection theorists can't answer. Is there a particularly powerful objection that you've had to answer that they've given towards your theory or not? And if so, what is it? Uh, no, not yet, uh, because it's just getting there. Uh, I mean, the normal course of it would be, uh, was, was first of all, you know, anger at, at <laughs> how, how, you know, how dare you, um, you're selling out to the creationists. <laughs> you know, all sorts of stuff, and then, um, uh, then that now it's getting to the point where people are starting to, uh, you know, frame their objections, you know, as opposed to just being angry and defensive. You're actually getting your objections. Yeah, and uh, and there undoubtedly will be some some valid ones, uh, pretty sure. Uh, and what? Uh, to, 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 and I, I think I was mentioning somebody in the car that there's a, an issue on, on sexual selection coming out in the uh, proceedings of the Royal Society to be, and I have a paper in it, and and so this this is with hardcore sexual selectionists, and they're willing to have a paper on social selection as the alternative to sexual selection. That represents the first time when it's been mainstream enough. In these ideas to actually be included in, in the compilation song. So now we're going to find out what the problems are. The typical reaction I get is, how do you test it? It can't be tested. So then we go through, well, this is how you test it. You know, you damn well could test this in lots of ways. And, uh, and then you haven't explained X, or we'll mention some phenomenon. And of course, this is new. It's not as though we've got uh, 150 years worth of um, experience. Uh, 
spinning narratives for the sorts of traits that sexual selection is currently being used for. Um, so uh, as to where I think it's most vulnerable, uh, where I would expect the objections to come, uh, I guess, I, I guess I might be I might be assuming too much of the animal mind that the animal mind is capable of more than is not as capable as much of as as much as I attribute to it. Um, but you never know. I mean, our history has been underestimating animals, so I tend to overestimate them. You know, so I could be wrong. And if if I've overestimated them, then a number of things might not be possible that I'm imagining are possible, like uh, sophisticated bargaining and remembering and uh, keeping contracts. Uh, so some of that might not be possible. I do think that the supposition of uh, pleasure-based cooperation is likely to be true because increasing evidence coming out about um, you, you know, the socially mediated horm hormones and polypeptides and you know, endorphins and things which uh, um, gin up in the bloodstream uh, when, when pleasurable activities happen, including in social contexts. So I think I'm on pretty good ground there. Uh, the, uh, the, a, a real problem will be my interpretation of courtship as uh, the, or some parts of courtship as a premarital negotiation. Um, that's going to be hard to prove because I need a so-called courtship semantics. So I need to be able to say that when a bird does this, it means something. When a bird does that, it means something. So I need to be able to parse the behavior into a, a I need to semantically parse the behavior. And um, that would take quite a bit of work to do. I, I'd like to do some of that with the albatross. And that may not be possible, or um, <clears throat> so. Is that? That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah, that's where I think. All right, let's 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 thank Joe, and then we can go outside. <laughs>